Hello and welcome to the Mind Body Soil podcast, a podcast where we explore the innate connection between the mind, the body, and the soil. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Smart Soil. Smart Soil is an online education platform creating courses and providing resources from farmers for farmers. Join us as we share the stories and experiences from those dedicated to regenerating ecosystems, communities, and human beings. This week on the Mind, Body, Soil podcast, we are lucky enough to be joined by the one and only El Professor Darren Doherty. G'day, Darren. Welcome to the show, mate. Thanks, mate. I believe it's El Prof- Professor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, potato, potato, mate. That's right. Um, yeah, I most... also accept the ma- maestro. But uh, okay. that's all a bit of a wank, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, mate, we won't get caught up in that. Um, no, please not. Let's not. So, founder of the Agrarians Platform, um, doing amazing work all over the world. Um, thousands of uh, regenerative agriculture designs under the belt. I won't um, pump your tyres up too much. And if everyone wants to find your work, Darren, you're not too hard to find. You've done plenty of podcasts, um, a lot of stuff on the more technical side of agroforestry and implementation um implementation i should say um and so yeah today hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that mindset um i know you're really good at referring to the climate not only as uh the geographical sense but the um climate of the mind so i'd like to really dive into some of that um but just to start with could we go into uh what really activated you into regenerative ag i know um you grew up at your uh, grandma and grandpa's farm. Um, but yeah, just, just what really has lit the fire and how have you seen that um, sort of amplify over the years to really specialise you in into where you've ended up? Um, well, thanks for the opportunity to catch up with you again, um, first of all. Um, I think... Um, I mean, it's probably the same for a lot of people. This is our 30th year, um, starting in March. Uh, March the 6th is our 30th anniversary. And I think if you ask me this same question in a year's time, I'll probably have a slightly different response. But um, I think the the uh, ultimately the, the, the key driver to being involved in this space is the... Is, the goodwill of people uh, that we work with to be engaged with um, a uh, with a landscape in a good way, um, and I think that that's really been when I think about it now, it's probably been the core driver, because I think most people who are engaged in land management have some sort of uh, affinity, love, whatever you want to call it for the land and, and its species mm-hmm. and the land itself. Um, it's how that's able to be expressed. Um, that's where it's all different because people come from different backgrounds. They've got different skill levels. They've got different starting points. Um, they're at different points in their life. They've got, you know, so there's all of it, which is that, you know, that context thing that we mm-hmm. so often talk about. And I suppose how we frame that is that, you've got your context and that of those you work with and where you are and you know who they are and how much cash you've got and all and what your outlook is and all of those sorts of things so that sort of builds the human context and then how does that um how how does the land's context um come together with that um because it's in a different it's in its state and it's where it is and and so on so trying to the the challenge of trying to help people navigate the the nexus of those two um contexts Mm. which are very broad um is is and remains the challenge yeah and then i suppose the the sort of big part of that that's perhaps a bit disappointing these days is um that um, that our context is not wrapped up in that as well <laughs> from an outcomes perspective. So, you know, the first part of my career was me playing God. People would, you know, write to me. They'd, um, they'd send me letters, bring me on the, on the landline back in the dark days. Um, <laughs> no, but they'd, and they'd say, oh, we want to do this. And 
you're the guy to help us do that, right? So it's that traditional, yep. um, you know, architect role, master planner role. You get hired to do a job. And it was really my context. So they'd say, I want an olive grove. I want trees. I want fencing. I want water, blah, blah, blah. But can you design it all for me? I go, yeah, sure. I can do all that shit. So I'd do that and then we'd go and develop it. And it was really my plan and my landscape. And it's really cool to go back to those places and I think of them as mine. Yeah. Whereas now, because I realised some, I don't know when, but I, at some point along the road, I put my ego to one side, um, not that I don't have one, but I put my ego in design and in that driver's seat to one mm-hmm. side. And that um, really meant that it's your expression now, not mine. Um, I'll certainly help you help guide you with that, with some of the experience that I've had in doing this design development, project management stuff and what that can look like. But ultimately it's, um, it's, it's yours, mine. Mm -hmm. So the, um, I still would like from time to time to have a job that was mine, that was someone else's, but you know, it's, (laughs) (laughs) it's all about getting the best outcome. So things have changed. Do you know what I mean? Like the the goalposts and the ways, the ways and means of doing things and liaising with people and their landscapes, um, um, has changed quite a lot, but there's still that fundamental, um, so want, teaching... want for improvement, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. So you're teaching the man to fish, so to speak. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's that's a that's a um, a metaphor that I use or a phrase um, that I use quite a lot because yeah. it's just that. Yeah. And so you're saying that then in that model, um, that the longevity or the ownership or the the management of that system that you construct is, um, is it seeing some benefit? because of that yes and no it's sort of like humans and their projects and the way they do things um are complex and a lot of people don't have confidence and that's why they come and they do learnings or they reach out to you know so-called experts um to help them um with that and that's that's where sometimes you it's a sort of a strange lever to pull where you sort of like, you want to leave someone to remain in control, but by the same token, you know, I'll put it this way. When you take on the whole participatory um, engagement model as a facilitator, um, there's a delicate um, set of steps that you might, where you might, move out of the facilitator role back into the sort of expert role again you move it you know you're moving in and out of the driver's seat or you're sitting beside someone a bit more yeah and you take the mouse or you take the wheel as it were right um so that sometimes people need that even this morning i had a correspondence with a gent in mexico who's been an agronomist for 50 years and he's he's in his retirement phase now and he's he's wants to do he's got his own block of land and he wants to um, also do consulting which is not an unusual thing for someone to do as a kind of a retirement project because they've got a lot you know they've got 40 or 50 years of of really um, strong expertise in his work as an agro for a for a company right so now he's in that period of his life and he's he's in his 70s and he's active you know he's in good health and he's just had this job with someone and the person's just not listening to him not um not not respecting him mm-hmm. in a sense and my, I, I said to him look let that guy go um and he, he uh, that already happened but i said to him look that person you'll never be able to work with them because they're you know when when you start working with people it's a relationship and you've got to um just like any other relationship you've got to sort of set the terms of what that's going to look like and and be upfront about that and if someone's paying you like if someone rings you up and says hey come and help well they've already they've already admitted that you've got something to offer. Yep. Well, if that's the case, there's a bit of power in that. You know I mean, you don't have to use it as power, but you know what I mean? Like you're sort yeah. of going, let's, let's um, understand what, what this relationship's going to look like mm. and what are the steps that are going to go. So like this guy, 
the client that he was working with, um, he would never like he'd get the bulldozer going before and do all of this road work and this, that, and the other before um, my student um, would he come out there and he go, why have you done this? We were just going to talk about how to do that. I've come across that sort of, and I can't work with people like that. I just yeah. go, nah, I'll sack you. I'd rather not because it's just too, it's just, it just drags you down and it's mm. just, you know, you know better. So you do it. It's all your job. I've got nothing to give you because you, you're not a team player, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're not, we're not, we're not in the, we're not in the um, respect game here because mm. yeah. So there's a lot of that sort of mentoring that we do as well, um, yeah. where sometimes we've got to let people know how to work with some people who you just can't work with. And yeah. it's unfortunate that a lot of those people have got means to do whatever the hell they like. Um, like this guy, he can just bulldoze his way <laughs> through everything, you know, um, and you just hope that the landscape and whoever else he's working with can stand up to that. But that's the world, right? Um, Absolutely. You, you, you give people free will and capital and machinery um, and you can do a lot and you can do a lot really good and you can do a lot really shit too. So Yes. Yeah. And I, I guess it's, um, well, there's that reflection there, I guess, of, you know, if he's losing that respect for that relationship or there's not that respect there, then well, how's he going to have respect for the landscape in that sense too? Like you say, just well, charging. Well, yeah, exactly. And how's his relationship with, you know, the people that he's probably got workers there, you know, he's yeah. on it goes, you know. Yeah. With yeah. His family members it's, a, it's a fascinating um, point of conversation and, and something I would expect to get into a little bit deeper um, down the road. But, um, but it's something we touched on in a conversation the other day, but, it's just so fascinating to me that the love and the energy that is put into a product um, or a landscape uh, can then be reflected in the product that is produced out of that landscape as well. So say like the taste and the sure. Um, sure. the medicinal uh, component, but even the way that um, that say a land landholder or a caretaker can have some sort of burden or um I don't know what you would call it, something something not right with them, and then they go out and reflect that onto the landscape. Um, is that something you see quite often or is... Yeah, um, oh, absolutely. And yeah. I mean, um, call it whatever you will, but I, I prefer, I like to, I like to word, use the word expression. You know, you, yeah. you, hear, you hear people say, this is a genetic expression or this is a, an expression of taste. Um, this mm -hmm. is an expression in form and so on. I think the word expression um, uh, covers a lot of angles, if you like, and um, it goes to what you were just pointing out, that if you put the, the energy of good intent into, um, into what you're doing, um, whether that's the relationships that you hold or the, or the land that you're um, working with um, and all of its species, um, whether they're biodiversity or productive, uh, or production, I should say, um, then um, that expression should carry through in a whole range of different ways as a product, right? Um, yeah. And that product, depending on with you know how metaphysical you are, then well, what beliefs you hold there um, in that mm. expression, the good vibe, as it were, that's coming <laughs> off the whole thing. Yeah. But then there's also the direct uh, expression of detail that you are putting into what you do. And I, and I don't distinguish um, conventional farmers in this way either. I mean, there's a lot of conventional farmers out there who do a, a you know, they, they tick the boxes, right? Um, they, they do a lot of work on, make, on, on putting an expression of quality and value into what they do. And, of course, that then that, that gets reflected in the product. Now, mm. if it all gets m mixed up with a whole lot of other people's conventional but i could say the same thing for um, let's say a commodity organic would be the same i mean yeah. um you know we we own a food outlet and you can see that coming through in some of the commodity organic products that we that we have here there's a diff there's you can see um you know it's a unique position that i hold that when i get a you know when we get some um product 
come through fresh or or um, shelf stable i'll put it that way um you can see the those expressions come through yeah um and that goes through to the packaging and the pride and all of that sort of stuff you know which yeah. is part of the whole package yeah. um right through to just the just how clean the product is, how um, how what its shelf life is like, and then ultimately the ultimate expression is, well, how do, how does it handle being um, put through a culinary preparation process, yeah. and then the ultimate is what does it taste like, right? Yeah. yeah. So we see those expressions. It's quite. I suppose we're very fortunate to have a food outlet um, to be able to see that perhaps a bit differently to um, how um, say most consultant types um, in this space would. Yeah. And that's, that's obviously deliberate. Hey, Darren, or is that just out of passion that you've chosen to have that? Um, oh, no, it's out of chance that. because uh, kids okay. lost their jobs during COVID. So right. um, we um, worked together as a family to take an opportunity to take on a, a food outlet, a, a restaurant cafe, here in Castle May. Good on you, mate. Um, do you want to drop the name of that place? Because it oh, looks pretty bloody groovy. And it's for sale. So we're done with that project. The kids have moved on. Okay. COVID is over, so it's up for sale. So yeah, we're right. ready to move on to our next thing. Nice. Did, any ideas what that might be yet? Or are you uh, keeping that under wraps? Of... What your next project? Oh, um, no. Our, well, the kids have got their own thing they're doing. Yeah, um, okay. Um, so, uh, you know, on the onset of COVID, um, once it locked borders and mm. all of that sort of thing, um, and had, had people's core economies shaken, yes. um, required a fair amount of adaptation and immediate adaptation. So we didn't, didn't, uh, wait for things to. Um, happened to us we're pretty mm. proactive people so we just took the steps now that that's all changed now that's the situation you know we've gone to some sort of COVID normal so um, the kids have, and the kids have got older too um, and a lot wiser and a lot stronger over this period having been business owners so yeah um, yeah so they're they're often about doing their thing fantastic so but for us I mean I'll keep doing what I've always done, which yeah. is be a farm planner, educator, yeah. so on. Yeah. Yeah. But what a what a great experience though. I mean, and probably got to scratch that itch a little bit from the old hospo days to like Yeah, to time. an extent. And it's good. Yeah, it's good. We've made a lot of friends here. It's um that's yeah. where I am right now. Um yeah. and um yeah, it's it's certainly been good and it's a good good to have been embedded in our community since we've been travelling so much for you know, since pretty well since 2004, we've 2004 up until 2019, end of 2019, we're out of the country for 70, 80% of the time. Yeah. Our son had been, who's our youngest, he's 21, uh, up to 2019, he'd been out of Australia for 80% of his life. <laughs> so, but now he's moved in with his girlfriend and, you know, he's living the life with her and um, it's great. Yeah, it's, ah. Awesome, mate. Um, oh, that's that's so cool. And and I'd like to yeah just touch on those travels a little bit too because you're freaking always ahead of the eight ball. And um, and you know when people are saying do one thing, you're doing the other. So uh, like this opening a restaurant, everyone would have been shutting their restaurants because of um, all this happening. And and uh, there you are establishing a, a thriving. Well, I'm glad we did it in in country Victoria, not in metropolitan Melbourne. That would have been a complete disaster. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. Copped a bit of flack from the community, perhaps, um, if if that were the case in in, in uh, Victoria. But but um, oh, just this so interesting. And so you your first tour uh, to America. I mean, you when when did you first get out to to the states? And um, and I guess I would like to tie it into your journey to Polyfaces, uh, the film, and how that came about because that was that was quite a um, well it. It was pretty bloody awesome how you made all that happen and and put a lot on the line but uh, i bet you have mm. have no regrets um yeah um well the first first trip out of australia to the us was in 2006 that was just i went and did a permaculture taught a permaculture course in wisconsin 
but then the following year, um, I was living in Vietnam at that time, uh, working on a project for Mars Incorporated, and I went and did that course. And then the following, later on that year, um, I designed what I called the soil, water and carbon for every farm tour. Um, and so it was basically a key line design based sort of response to um, to climate change and and the agricultural solution to that which was very much influenced by um, alan yeoman's uh, pa yeoman's uh, middle son and owner of the yeoman's plow company he wrote a paper or pre presented a paper in 1992 um, on the agricultural solution to the greenhouse effect as it was known then and that was at the Esalen Institute in California. So that paper, and then Alan, Alan and I have been friends for a long time. And you know, his um, his birthday is the day after mine, and he, he but he was born in nineteen thirty one, so he's ninety two this year, wow. and very active. But he'd written a book, or he'd written a a um, a manuscript, which was provocatively titled. Um, green pawns and the and the uh, greenhouse effect or something like that because he had this whole true or not he had this whole um, I won't, I'll stop short of saying it was a conspiracy but um, this sort of concept that the green movement um, which has since been proved mm. a lot of the green movement and their um, uh, quelling of the rise of nuclear energy um, was funded by the fossil fuel companies. Um, so, and I'll leave it at and that's because Alan believes that nuclear power has a role to play yes. um, in, yeah. in combating uh, climate change, as many people do. And, you know, it's a valid view, you know. Absolutely. So, um, in spite of it all. So he, um, but the larger part of that, that I, that really grabbed me in terms because I have no influence over nuclear energy, right? What yeah. I do have an influence over is agriculture. So um, it was his um, factoid where he pointed out that if the world increased, if the world's five billion hectares of arable land, not agricultural land, but arable land, increased its carbon content in a in a foot of soil, thirty centimeters of soil by 1.5%, then that would relate to a 100 part per million download effectively of, um, of, of CO2 uh, from the atmosphere. All right? And I went, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Does that sound doable? Well, probably. Um, and where's the best place to start that? And I was thinking all of this through and I was working for Mars Incorporated, who are one of the biggest food companies in the world. So I could see uh, and we introduced cacao to Vietnam. I was part of that whole project. So I could see the power and we were working with the World Cacao Foundation. So I was working not only with Mars, but the World Cacao Foundation, which is Nestle, um, you know, Hershey's, Mars, you name it, all of the really big chocolatiers. About as big as it gets. Big, pardon? About as big as it gets really in yeah. terms of... So yeah. I was working with them and so I could see that relationship between um, good corporate practice um, and policy coming together because that's what we were doing with our Vietnam project. And I thought, well, if you're going to try and solve this problem and you're going to try and get it so that we could do this, then where do you go? Well, you don't go to the, you don't go to the Wimmera and you don't go to the central west of New South Wales or the wheat belt in WA, you go to the Midwest of the United States mm. because what, what happens there and the policy and all the rest of it that goes with that, that's what drives change around the world. I mean, that's where no, you know, it's I'm, I'm being simplistic here, but that's where a lot of what drives agricultural policy occurs. And the other part about it is this is on arable land and arable land is i'll put this out uh, arable land which includes um hortic uh, row row crop horticulture it's the best land in the world because it has to be 
in order for it to be to have tillage practices and to have harvesting equipment and all that, it can't be too slopey. The soils have to be relatively good to start with. So there's an agricult there's a relatively high level of agricultural capability on those landscapes. Mm-hmm. And I'll generalize, but a lot of the practitioner a lot of the land managers on those landscapes also happen to be relatively advanced in their in their um, uh, work with in the livestock sector. That's probably in the in the outdoor livestock sector. That's probably only dairying where you've got the same level of intensity of engagement. Mm-hmm. So I put all of that together, and that's why we decided to go to the US and do that there, and then to Europe to do that there, because that's the other big place that drives policy yeah. and drives change. Um, and we did that wrapped up in the sort of key line set of key line practices. Now, what happened with that, I also called it my interview with the planet because I hadn't traveled much, been to Vietnam, um, been to New Zealand, um, been to Argentina, but I hadn't, and but it was just drop-ins, you know, yeah, apart yeah. from Vietnam. Um, so I, I called it my interview with the planet. So we, we designed a tour that went, that ultimately went for 13 months with my wife and our three children. And um, we bought all the tickets, self-funded uh, two sets of round world tickets um, for the lot of us, and off we went. And um, and that introduced us to a lot of stuff. Um, it had us take on a lot of new stuff, so that we weren't. So at that stage, the main things that we were, I suppose, expressing were agroforestry key line and permaculture design, but particularly agroforestry key line. Um, and, um, and then from that, we sort of um, really pulled in holistic management um, and a whole range of other methodologies, which sort of started to frame what we now call the, or are now part of the collection of methodologies um, that we have uh, embraced within the Rigorians platform. So it was a really big time. And then, of course, that introduced us to Joel and you know, to your next question around the polyphases thing. So I think by 2008, after well, yeah, early 2008, we came home from that first trip and then we um, went, all right, well, what's next? And because we just had all of these requests to come back and do more, you know, we need to follow, you know. And we're strategic people and I could see from my work in Vietnam again and other projects um, that there's a longitudinal nature. Like you can't, when you're introducing concepts, you can't just drop into a landscape and then walk away. You've got to actually, you can't just go and, you know, just flick a flame and not have the, not have the, not have the, all the firewood ready for, for the next season. You gotta, yeah. you know, you gotta do all of that um, yeah. work. You gotta grow the forest to, to fuel the fire as it were, all those metaphors. So. So we started to develop all these relationships and then we started to deepen the strategy around, you know, how we would um, get things embedded ultimately. Um, and that's, but that proved to be um, pretty successful, a tactic. So a lot of markets we introduced, let's say, regenerative agriculture to, and they've had, an, um, and in, because of that approach, that's had, a, had an enduring result in a whole range of different markets. Um, and it's also, what's also had is the effect that it's not been something that's just been under one banner. Yeah, It's been like, because what we tried to embed as a core logic in response was don't just, don't just follow holistic management. You know, don't just do agroforestry. You don't just yeah. do permaculture. Don't just do key line. You know, there's, you've got to have, there's a lot of there's a lot of context that you've got to deal with, so don't get um, don't get sort of bridled by one methodology. Um, it's, it's there's too much complexity to just to to hold yourself back. So that led us to meeting with Joel because in two thousand and nine, our next tour, we designed the carbon farming tour yeah. and the carbon economy tour. Um, and I, at that stage, then I decided what I wanted to do was have this sort of longitudinal training. So when we'd come in, it wouldn't just be me. 
it would be i'd be a part of it i'd do my water stuff and that that i'm water agroforestry project development sort of the whole integrationalist thing that i do quite well but then i'd get in kirk gadzia to do um, all the holistic management so we had him do that first then we had myself do the sort of farm planning stuff integration stuff then we have um, someone uh, like elaine ingham um, or eugenio grass um, do the soils uh, amendments biological mix sort of side of things and then we'd have joel um do the polyface and the and the whole how do you sell this um and and joel's got such a magical human um he's got such a great charisma and enthusiasm it's just re- he's a really good person to end something like that with yeah 100%. so we do three day and then a month three day and then a month and so we did that and that worked really, really well. Um, and then we did the same back in Australia. I created the region ag brand and we did that um, in 2010 because um, I didn't want to use carbon farming because carbon by that stage, it got a, I called it, it got become a dirty word in pop politically. And um, yeah, and then that led us to, you know, we go to, go to Polyface and we've got this idea when we met these um, filmmakers in Europe, in Mallorca, they wanted to do a film about us. And I said, oh, I don't really want to do a film about us because I'm not, I'm not ready for that. And what would come, the attention, I didn't really want it. Mm-hmm. So, because our kids were still growing up and so on. Um, you know, that's, again, you've got to think about consequences, uh, yeah. which is always hard. But, you know, anyway, um, so we just, and we had a bit of money saved up and, and we uh, we sold a property um, and we had some money from that. And so we decided to um, fund because we were really keen to see um, the polyface thing because we just felt there was a lot of Joel had a new book out and da, 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 da. it just seemed like a really good time to um, cover them and what they've done and what they do. So, yeah, so we spent and about 120 of our own money and then got about another 120 or 30 of other people's money and um, made a film over three years for, yeah, from 2011 to 2015. It was yeah. a pretty big effort. My wife did an enormous job in pulling that all together and being the producer director along with our daughter, Isabella, yeah. who did a lot of the filming and also the direction and a local team of editors here in, and so on. Um, Amazing. Yeah, and financially, not so good um, at all. Um, it really changed our life financially. Um, so we've not rebounded from that really well. Yeah. Um, but that's, we knew that risk. Um, yeah. It's not like we're destitute. Um, yeah. Yeah. But um, we don't have what we had. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, you know, that's okay because we're very proud of the project and we continue to get people the right to say, hey, we watched that film and it's changed our lives, it's changed yeah. the way we eat, it's changed the way we farm, it's changed. So, you know, well, that's you it. can't... Can't put a value on that. Like it's, or at least... We'd like to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and Lisa says, Joe Rogan, why don't you keep interviewing bloody Joel? Why don't you give a shout out to your 75 billion people who watch you? And um, oh, mate. We, could sell, we could sell some of these films, but uh, you know, it's all. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah. Anyway. I'm, com- I'm confident it will hockey stick one day, mate. Um, it's a Well, it's, cra- a, it's an interesting cracker. film because it's still got a high level of currency. Like it was, yeah. well, it's hard to say. Wow. It's hard to think. In September this year, it will have been out for eight years. So it's not yeah. a young film. Um, but it was certainly ahead of its time. And um, I think it still holds. I haven't watched it for a while, but it's uh, a, yeah, it's a really, yeah, we're very proud of it. It's a really good piece. It's it won a lot awesome. of really good awards. I mean, we just couldn't believe the awards that we won. It was yeah. pretty amazing. I mean, so it's just, yeah, it's a freaking awesome story, mate. And it takes it. Um, well, it's their, I mean, it's their story. We just used, we were inspired, which is the brief that I wrote to start with. I said I wanted to have sort of David Attenborough style um, mm. cinematography that captured um, 
the beauty that, you know, you or anyone else who's involved in the land sees. I mean, if you see a cow shit, <laughs> um, if you, it's, it's, and then what happens after that, the shit hits the ground and all of, and it's just mad, there's just so much that in high, in our high definition, which yeah. we have as humans, yeah. um, which you just, you just think, wow, that's bloody amazing. And you look at, you know, having grown up with, as a lot of us have with Sir David Attenborough's team and their cinematography and what that does to someone emotionally, mm-hmm. but then I've also grown up with Australian story. And that was the other part of my brief was to bring those two together. So you've got that marriage of that high level cinematography, which we did the best that we could Mm. with our resources and our skills. And I think we did pretty well. Um, And, but the storytelling, and that was a really, and you see that a bit more now, um, you know, know, like small little farm and a few other films that have come out subsequently. um, They've, they've gone for that narrative style yes. that is very if you and if you know when i tell you that and then you watch poly faces you can see australian story all through it absolutely right? yeah so. yeah well and just like the timing of, of bringing out a film on that i mean it's yeah i mean if you it's funny that a lot of people have just followed that that blueprint now it's it's um it's a it's a popular narrative and i think the the story it's it's time has come you know it's a, it's an important time mm, um yeah. and 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 it gets to the next part is like how do we how do we then scale this and and reach the masses yeah. with the with the right message um because like you say carbons uh if it was a dirty word in 2008 then it's an obscenity now <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no nah, I, I don't know um i don't know i don't know so much i think it's i think it's still there um i mean we've been through a pretty politically a very turbulent last decade or so mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think that's over by any stretch, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of chickens that are coming home to roost on the, and like, if I, I look at this from the energy perspective, right. Yeah. Um, the, I think the Ukraine situation has, uh, proved to us how, how precious we are with energy, um, how precious precarious we are with energy, yeah. um, especially fossil, fossil energy. And so good, bad or ugly, um, then that's forced a lot of people to look outside of the outside of the box, just from the perspective of, you know, when you when you have such a big player in terms of Russia being um, effectively um, removed from the Western market, um, then that makes people think, well, what are we going to do? Um, so that it, it doesn't diminish the fact that fossil fuel resources are still there. Yeah. But it does. It does come. It, there's there's those opportunities, I suppose, that that come from that, and that's so that's been interesting to to watch. Mm. But look, I've, it's a really it it's as soon as you get bureaucracy involved in anything, um, and I would call big corporates bu- bureaucracies in themselves because they are. Yes. Um, they've got they've got corporate practices which are which are very bureaucratic and so on. But when you get, when you get to that sort of level of engagement, um, then the, some of the purity of objective um, starts to be removed. And we're seeing that already, you know, a lot of people now are going, oh, you know, regenerative is the next sustainable. Um, it's, the, it's the next organic. Yeah. Um, it's being commodified. Yes. <clears throat> and it's a fairly usual trajectory, I think, for something where you have um, people who are early adopter, innovator types who come up with these sorts of things, and then it reaches the early majority stage mm-hmm. in terms of market penetration. And then at that stage, of course, there's only the early adopters and the innovators have got no more role to play there. Yeah. So it gets started to get, so it gets be- bureaucratized and it gets regulated and it starts to you know the, the perfection of it mm-hmm. um starts to get diminished that's just an inevitability i don't think you can really avoid that so if we get to that stage and you know if 80 percent of the integrity of what um, is actually required is 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 embedded well then well and good but i'm not necessarily seeing that um 
I mean, we one of the purposes of the Polyface movie was again, um, it's this promise of America, the United States of America. Like we tried to pitch to them, to the to the soccer mum's heart, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that was our because we realised that you know I got a statistic um, when I did a talk over there years ago. You know, there's 126. Um, consumers to every farmer in the US, right? Um, and it actually gets worse in terms, if you look at that from a ratio, some people would say that's, that's really good. Wow, the US producers are so efficient, but, um, right? Um, but it actually gets worse when you calculate the number of consumers to every profession, uh, to full-time agriculture is their only source of income farmer. Okay. Right. It's yes. about, and the stats are very similar for here in Australia. Yeah. So, um, it, I think that reduces by about another two thirds again. So when you look at that ratio, mm-hmm. right? Well, a lot of us who are working in agriculture and myself included up to that point, we'd been focusing a lot of our messaging towards the farmers and getting them to change practice. But you know, you you're pulling the dog by the tail not not <laughs> not you know, the, it's the dog's head still drives what what its tail does right so yeah, yeah. um you you're much better off just going to the head and the head is the consumer yeah and they're owned by the corporations so um because they're the early and late majority so we needed to and what are they driven by and so on well they're driven by emotion um as well as especially mothers um as parents uh they're they're trying to do the you know do the best with their budget yes um to raise their children and their family so um so that was where we were pitching to and to show them that they could make significant changes in their lifestyle and their life quality Mm. and even do that on less of a food budget than what they are now yeah so um which has been a continual accusation, which is quite reasonable if you're a poor consumer. Yeah. If you don't have any um, culinary capabilities and you are a organic consumer, you're in for a very expensive food budget, right? Yes, yes. But if you have culinary capabilities, mm-hmm. then and you spend the time that you should spend on um on engaging with that and your food system Mm -hmm. as opposed to spending time on things which aren't very positive Mm -hmm. because a lot of people have a lot of time and they spend time doing all sorts of shit yes so a lot of it's built around that choice um like people say they're time poor and then you look at what they're doing you go you're on your phone all the times looking at instagram i mean you could be spending take a third of that time away and put it into engaging with your food supply and get deals, right? So there was all of that sort of thing that we were trying to um, embed in our messaging there Mm -hmm. so that we could have people um, uh, change their food supply habits. Now, if they were to do, and that was, again, the promise of America, if you got a a mild change in... in, um, in consumer practice over there well and that drives again drives food policy right so yeah yeah, yeah that's and it's such a like you said a a space like that um is so full of emotion and there's so much messaging uh constantly like that you're up against so it's it's probably quite a busy um it's, a busy oh, it's hard because geez yeah. you, you know you look at you see it here you see it everywhere. I go into supermarkets and I just go, you bastards. I mean, people don't think they're paying attention. You go, like you walk in and they've set their, like all of a sudden they've set their their place up to look like a, whether it's the colours. I mean, they have colour consultants. You know, BP took two and a half years to change their green, right? And it's not, it's not like they didn't do that. Just go, oh, yeah, I don't think I like that green. No, they had a whole <laughs> team of psychologists work around the change of the colour green, right? Yeah. Um, Woolworths took 
a, a fair bit of time, but did an amazing job at changing their shops so they look like farmers markets. And when yeah. they don't do that just because it's a nice thing to do, yeah. I mean, yeah. don't be so damn naive, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and they continue to hold market position, mm. right? Yeah. And people, you hear people talk about them as if they're these heroes, right? It's like, yeah, they're, they're amazing. They are amazing. So don't, you know, don't be under any illusion about what you're up against. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to change the food system, because you've got people who have, you know, marketing is a very sophisticated art. It's very well understood. And if it's well resourced, mm -hmm. then it's a, it's a, it's a hard beast to beat. Um, totally. You don't, you don't have, you know, you as you, as an individual producer who's out there trying to um, uh, pump your tires up in the market and trying to have a level of engagement. You, know, you don't have, you know, you don't, you say you have a marketing budget. You don't have a marketing budget. You have an advertising budget. Yes. You know, marketing, advertising is an, is an outcome of marketing. It's not marketing. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? That's, so there's yeah. all of that sort of stuff, which, you know, you really, I wouldn't say get disheartened by, but, but just know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? And once you, once you see, you can't unsee sort of thing too, I imagine. It's that's right. Sort of like you just keep learning and, and seeing. Yes, um, that's exactly right. So, yeah, it, it sort of goes where I was hoping we would end up heading is, is in towards that sort of mindset and that psychological shift and just how much of that is present um in both the markets and in the way that uh caretakers are managing their land as well you know it's a it's a huge shift now and the cards are very much stacked against them to to transition because they're so yeah. um it's so well built uh these yeah. systems and and oftentimes expensive equipment and all those sorts of things that may restrict that transition or um so I'm just interested to get your thoughts. If you could, you know, may, wave that magic wand and, and see, say, maybe a couple of shifts um, occur on farm globally, or, or what would you see the most important um, small changes that uh, might might occur? Well, I think I, I see a lot of value in in audit, um, and that audit takes a number of levels, and that's where we've sort of landed with people is just to to take a Take, take the time if you can, uh, or make the time if you can, I should say, um, to step away from what you're doing and look at what, what you do, you're doing. Excuse me. I just had some sparkling water. It was a bit sparkly. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, sort of take yourself out of where you are and look, at, look as if you're in a, you know, looking, looking down at yourself. <laughs> both it, well, you as an individual and then, you know, most people who are working in agricultural enterprises are not doing it alone. Um, mm. They're doing it with a, with a people and often their family. So, but just, but just try and understand where you're at. Um, and like I said, at the start, you know, so much of what we're trying to do here and what we're help trying to help people with is just to see not only where they're at, but where their family's at, where their community's at, where what they perceive their market to be at um, and the economy to be at, mm -hmm. right? So that's the human part of this. Yes. And then you've got a landscape and where's it at and mm -hmm. all of its components. So that's where, you know, I suppose what we've developed with our Regrarians platform, I mean, it's designed to be comprehensive because you can't not be. It's like there's a lot of complexity and trying to navigate that complexity needs some organisation. Mm. So we've done the best that we can with that to try and checklist that a bit. So yeah. let's say you're a livestock or cattle producer, for example. Um, well, then you've got you've got a landscape and what's it made up of? Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, this, you start with the landscape and what is it shaped? What are the soils? What's its ca inherent capability as a landscape? And with that, whenever you're acknowledging capability, you're looking at it sort of like a SWOT analysis. You're sort of looking at, well, not all landscapes are, um, are um, class one landscapes. Sometimes you've got a bit of class eight, which is just, you know, it's vertical and <laughs> it's rocky and, you know, you, 
even goats can't persist on it. Um, you're right. So that that bit's out. Yes. Um, and then you've got all. So you're trying to segment the capability across your landscape, mm. and then try and consider then what's what are the opportunities um, and what are the costs? I suppose as much as anything. Yes. Is yeah. it so? And then. And with those opportunities, you're just trying to understand, well, what can I do? What interventions or treatments can I can I have in that sector or that segment um, in order to get improvement? Or do I have do I evaluate that that's actually not a reflection of where I'm at because I don't have the cash to do that? So, you know, like again, being a bit honest with where you're at and yes. being a bit honest about the capability of your landscape. So, like I would say. A lot of what we're doing is a capability context or mm. context of capability. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you get that, I think there's a good intent that comes with that in terms of an honesty. Yeah. And once it's like a lot of people, when they go to an accountant and they realize that their financial situation is not as good as it could be, sometimes that's a bit of a relief because they've had someone actually say it out how it is. Yeah. Um, I'd say that some people have said that to me when they've had a bad health report, right? They've actually come away from it going, and it's sort of put them, I wouldn't say put a limit on them, but it's sort of like put a scope to what's ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think people need, need a bit of that from time to time um, so that they can... Get a starting just, point. Or like, well, just, just, yeah, exactly. And, and sort of have a bit of honesty about where where, what, and how is, uh, um, uh, because the why is often not a problem. It's the, it's the actualization of the why into something that you can persist with is, is, uh, often a real challenge for people. I mean, I hear people, I read their holistic context and we, we go through literally hundreds of those about, about 250 to 300 holistic contexts a year through our Rex participants. And they all say the same thing, right? So the yeah. why thing um, is always the same. You know, it's yeah. want a ha healthy family life, want financial security, this, that, and the other, right? So I could just bundle all of that together. Yeah. The how, <laughs> <you know, laughs> that's 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 where the rubber hits the road and, yes. and then the when, right? Because yeah. this might take 20 years, might take longer than that, right? So that's... That's again why we've got to come back and just say, all right, well, where are we at? Mm. Let's be honest about that. And then let's see how we can, um, what interventions, treatments, et cetera, both on ourselves and our business and on the landscape that we can do over and over what period and what's that going to look like. Mm. That's that's where we'd like to see people start. Start, ah, yeah. And then, and, and then, well, then what happens after that? Well, that's a continual feedback loop right? i loved it i love that that's where you went and not like something physically that happens on the farm like it's like no there's oh, no. work oh. that needs to be done like i just get so tired by that oh you just need to do you just need cattle yeah you know it's sort of like yeah, oh, i've got a graph i've got a i've got a landscape function problem oh cattle will fix it it's like mm, mm. no well yeah maybe but look right. a bit bit like realize we're a bit deeper than that yeah <laughs> And it's a little more complex, perhaps. It's, yeah. Well, it is a bloody lot more complex, but, <laughs> yeah. but humans are also capable of a lot more depth than mm. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it it yeah. almost, it seems as though the, I mean, what you've designed with, with these layers is almost like a, a philosophical approach or it can be applied off farm and to, to your life in, in so many so many ways. Like I've noticed that when you're talking at, it seems like to make sense or to apply an appropriate lens with that, with that layer or, um, you know, I, I just think that's really, really cool. Okay. If... Mm. Well, I mean, I stand on the shoulders of lots of other people as a gatherer, um, as an, in well, you know, when you're in a position like mine, where I call myself an integrationalist, if I really come down to it, um, nice. then, you know, what am I integrating my own ideas? No, not generally. Um, I'm generally integrating what other people have already done. So, but perhaps because this is part of it too, you know, people who 
um, who are innovators and the innovators who have come up with most of these ideas, they're not necessarily good integrators because they've got their little fiefdom to, and they've got their great idea to sort yeah. of nurture and contain and, and, uh, and stop from stop from being integrated, right? Yeah. Nest, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so that's so I, I won't I won't uh, mention names, but there's a few people who are very prominent who've reached out to me and have not been that positive about my doing that, right? Because they see their their way as the way, right? Yes, yes. Um, okay. And I don't see that at all, and I, and I I find it um, I find it um, interesting that. Uh, in parenthesis that that some of those people would even think that way but mm -hmm. i un also understand it when i put it in the put it in the lens of innova of, innova of, of the characteristics of innovators yeah yeah and and perhaps they're waiting for that shedding of the ego a little bit too or like some of that or yes yeah. oh people talk that up but anyway whatever yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh daz um mate so, yeah what do i say I, I feel like we could have gone a lot of places today and, and this is probably perhaps just scratching the surface um mm. and i hope that we can chat more um so. upcoming and and yeah look forward to connecting a bit more throughout this year hopefully and even uh looking to get over to victoria but um if we can talk about that later that, that'd be good and um is there anything that you want to that you want to leave with people to um to get the noggin jogging or you know, just to think about as as we depart uh, from today's session, um, that you're that you're pondering or or thinking about uh, currently, perhaps for this year. Well, I think um, I think togetherness is something that uh, you know, is really important. So, if you haven't been, you know, um, sit down at the table and and put the phones away and the devices away and spend a bit more time in fellowship with, with, with each other and whether that's with your family or others and just have, take that time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can do that professionally or just socially. I think that's really important and to start to consider some of these um, broader issues about where you're going and, um, and uh, where things are at and take some of that on because I, I think that, that that sort of checking in it's you know like it's are you okay sort of stuff but it you know take it a bit beyond that is your land okay right? right and don't be afraid to have some of those sort of conversations it's not just about are you okay are your is your family okay is your community okay but is your land okay mm -hmm. and don't be afraid of where that takes you i think um in terms of a conversation um because uh, again, if the more honesty, honesty that we have, and this goes for the whole policy thing as well, you know, there's so much palaver about, oh, if we do this, you know, this intervention, then this will give us that. And it's like physics are honest, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if you're trying to solve the, the greenhouse effect problem um, or atmospheric carbon pollution issue, well, then realize it's a numbers game it's a physics game so you know be honest about that and you know and that's that's that starts with you being honest so yeah. i think that's 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 where it all starts but yeah beautiful mate hey um thanks again darren and um yeah look forward to catching up in the near future mate and keep up the bloody great work and if you right. haven't already go check out regrarians and polyface's film look after thanks, the man mate. cheers brother thank you take care thanks though cheers,